In this video, you'll learn how you can use the power of rituals to design better services. Here's the guest for this episode. Let the show begin. Hello, I'm Ted. Welcome to the Service Design Show. This is episode 170. Hi, my name is Mark Fontaine and welcome back to the Service Design Show. The show where we explore the secrets of what it takes to make businesses big and small more human again. All to help you design great services that have a positive impact on people, business and our planet. Our guest in this episode is Ted Matthews. Ted is the chair of service design at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design. Backed by years of research in the sacred services approach, that is an expert on how rituals shape our lives. Okay, so when you think about rituals, what is the first thing that comes to mind? Is it religious rituals like prayer or baptism or the things alike? Or maybe more everyday rituals like birthday, game nights, or maybe even your morning coffee. The truth is that rituals are so ingrained in our daily lives that neglecting them in your design process is somewhat like neglecting the human in us. Rituals truly offer an opportunity to connect with your users on a deep personal level. And that brings us to the theme of this episode. How can you incorporate the emotional power of rituals in every service you design? Because in order to make businesses more human again, we really need to embrace the moments we cherish, celebrate and remember in our design process. So if you stick around till the end of this episode, you'll know what rituals are and how they differ from habits and routines, how rituals shape our day-to-day -day lives, and how you can integrate the sacred services approach in your practice. As you can hear, a lot of interesting stuff is coming up, so I hope you're ready because we're going to jump straight into the conversation with Ted Matthews. Welcome to the show, Ted. Hi, Mark. <laughs> Hello. Uh, <laughs> that's always a good start. Ted, uh, looking forward to discussing the topic that uh, I've uh, introduced in the introduction. We'll dive into that a bit more. Um, you have a really interesting role uh, if people look you up on LinkedIn, uh, but maybe some of uh, our listeners haven't done so yet. So maybe uh, it would be great if you can uh, elaborate a little bit more about what your current role is. What do you do? Uh, what's your situation like these days? Yeah. Um, well, thanks for inviting us on the show. It's great to be able to talk about these things. But uh, no, I'm um, I'm a practicing service designer. I think it's really. I, I'm I also work in academia. So I'm an associate professor at the Oslo School of Architecture Design, and I'm I'm head of service design there. Um, so I, I think, and I also try to practice service design when I can, because I think it's really important for the students and for my research that it's actually based in, in practice itself. Um, but a few, well, last year now, I finished this very long PhD, which was much longer than it should have been, but uh, I finished a very long PhD, which I, I sort of explored um, what, you know, what rituals could mean for service design um, and explore sort of some of the peripheral elements around it. So things such as the power of symbols, storytelling, and how do we sort of work with extraordinary service experiences. And, and this has opened up a whole sort of world uh, of working with sort of highly experiential services, particularly work I've been working with uh, football, uh, professional football, working with finance, working with telecoms, all sorts of stuff. Um, and it's been a really rewarding and hard journey because you're working with quite complex um, theory from social anthropology and sociology and cultural theory. That was a very long introduction to what oh, I do. Yeah. Kind of, <laughs> well, that's covered the whole podcast there. Sorry. <laughs> we can finish there. You see that? <laughs> I, I think we'll be able to scratch the surface of a 10-year PhD today. Uh, <laughs> it's a super fascinating and interesting topic that I hope uh, a few people will get inspired by and dive deeper into after uh, today. Uh, okay. But before we do that, uh, we have a ritual of our own here on the show, and that is to do a quick lightning round. 
I've got five questions right. uh, for you to get to know you a bit better as a person next to the professional. Uh, just the first thing that comes to your mind. We won't elaborate on these answers, but uh, yeah. Are you ready? Oh, I was ready as I'll ever be. Yeah, give it a go. <laughs> I hope so. What's your favorite food, Ted? Oh, a Xiao Long Bao. Uh, soup dumplings. Uh, amazing. All right. What did you want to become when you were a kid? An anthropologist. No, I wanted to be an archaeologist. That's what I wanted to be. What a book or books are you reading at this moment, if any? <laughs> I'm, I'm, re I'm such a nerd. I'm reading, I'm, re it's by, I'm reading this book here, which is called Rituals uh, in Psychotherapy, Transition and Continuity. A classic. <laughs> Everybody, <laughs> Everybody has that one it. on their shelves. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> Bedtime <yeah>. stories. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next question. Uh, if you could be an animal, which animal would you like to be? Oh, I'd like to be one that flies. So I don't know what, maybe a swallow or something like that, which is kind of in, just beautiful and amazing, or a lark ascending, something like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, the final question uh, is, do you recall the first moment you got in touch with service design? Uh, yes, and that's kind of uh, probably back in 2007 when somebody told me I was a service designer. So that was kind of one of those moments where some, where I was just kind of thinking I was a designer and somebody said, yeah, but you're a service designer. And I said, no, no. And then, we, then it was one of those, well, what kind of things do you do? Well, we do active mapping and we're trying to understand the points of contact between people and public services. And they said, well, you're a service designer. And I pushed back against that for about five years. And yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, the face of denial. <laughs> yeah. But I have gone back to calling myself a designer again, because I, I think it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, I think we mix ourselves up in so many different things mm -hmm. um, that it would be a shame just to sort of say, we just design services, because I think we design mm -hmm. so many different things. Yeah. yeah. So uh, without going too much into uh, semantics, I've I've been letting go of the word designer, and mm. um, maybe it's a nuanced thing, but I'm moving into a service design professional, just like with uh, somebody who's in health a healthcare professional, and that can you can have many disciplines there. I don't know if it really makes a difference. For me, it makes a difference. Uh, I think it's a more inclusive way of thinking about our, it becomes a field rather than a profession if that makes sense <laughs> a discipline i know i'm still i'm still into um calling myself designer and mm -hmm. i think um i think for those of us uh, and maybe this doesn't sound inclusive but i think we should be we should be proud of the work that we've done in design through the years I think we should also be ashamed of some of the things that design has done through the years but i i do think design is a very is has a specific set of skills and tools and that's learned through our engagement with materials through making uh and you know i think we've kind of disconnected design process from the designer itself so i i hear this cliche all the time so all design thinking i'm a design doer it's almost like uh, the, um, you hear speeches now i'm a design doer not a design thinking uh, and but in a way it's correct i think there is something about the act of doing design and engaging with material, um, I say again, the making, the visualization, those skills that are classically connected to design that are really valuable. So I'm not quite ready to give up that title. Um, and if you know, it's, I mean, I spent what I spent first six years at design school in the 90s. And then I've worked with my profession uh, through many years. And I'm proud of those skills that I've developed. So not not wanting to exclude people, but I think it's okay to be proud of those particular skills that we bring to the design of services. We're not going to go deeper into this rabbit hole, but you <laughs> oh, did. go on. <laughs> Let's talk about this. <laughs> Let's do that off camera this time. <laughs> yeah, we'll do that. Um, but you, you, you did provide a very nice leeway into uh, the topic of today because you mentioned working with materials. Um, Product designers, industrial designers, we know that they have very tangible materials. Uh, they work with ergonomics, they material properties. Um, we understand that, but there are, when you're working with services and maybe with experience, there are different types of materials which are less discussed, um, but are nevertheless very fascinating and interesting. One of the materials that I've been using or 
um, uh, alluring to is the organization as your design material. That's not the topic for today. The topic for today is rituals as mm. a design material, correct? Mm. Yes, absolutely, indeed. So, I mean, so I mean, I think one of the one of the things that we find as a material for for services is time. So, how do we design with time? How do we understand? How do we change it and work with it and those kind of things? But we're also working a lot with people as material as well if we can it sounds very controversial to suggest that people are materials but then one of the things that's really really important is also culture and the cultural context within which people we find them and designing for them is also an enormous rich palette of materials to work with um and i think when people think of rituals they think of something religious uh but we we really rituals are part of our everyday lives so we have something as sim it's a a symbolic um action that expresses something meaningful um and it's really powerful for individuals for groups for you know for society so so something as simple as a handshake is a ritual so if you look at Irving Goffman's work around this idea that these interaction rituals that we have just something as simple as a handshake it's a symbolic interaction between people it's a ritual and you know it what it helps us do is actually deal with the anxiety of meeting someone so it's like there's an anxiety of what do I do now so let's do this performance together. And then suddenly from sort of, you put your hand out, you shake hands, you remove your hand again, and suddenly we know each other. And, but that's also culturally informed and culturally enclosed. So you both need to know, you know, what the handshake means and you both need to know how long you shake hands for. Those things we don't really think about. But, you know, if you shake hands for a very long time, someone's going to think this is really weird. But of course we have rituals daily. We have, you know, sometimes people have rituals of leaving the house. We have rituals of a week. Some people have Sunday dinner, at least in, in England. And then we have calendrical rituals like um, Christmas or birthdays. And then we have these rituals through life, um, like rites of passage, like maybe getting married or births or what have you. So, so we, the, we we don't often think about these rituals, but they infuse our everyday lives, and they're such an important part of our lives. And and if we don't if we if we don't design with rituals in our services, then we're not really that human centered because they're so important. That's my argument. Mm. It's just so important part of what we do. And I think that um, as material, it can be deconstructed, understood unpack those kind of things. So one of the things that say people like Van Gennep show us, uh, who's a, a folklorist from 100 years ago, who wrote a fascinating book about rites of passage, is that there are structures to rituals. So already we can see that there are structures. There's this idea that there's a phase where you leave something behind, a period of transition or liminality in the middle, and then a period of reincorporation where you kind of come back from your ritual experience change. And you'll find that in a handshake, you know, separation, you put your hand down, that's separating from not knowing you to, you know, shaking hands, which is a kind of weird in betwixt place, and then removing your hand. Now I do know you. Now the point of I'm telling this is that once you start to see those structures in ritual, then you can start using it as material uh, for service design. And and what you're doing, you're adding meaning to time. So suddenly it's not just about how do you pass the time, how do you add touch points to get somebody through a service. It's like how do I find moments of transition in a service experience where I can actually design these transitions the and give meaning to time but of course there's a there is a material just in the time aspect but there's also the all this other rich cultural material and as i say if we are to design rituals then we have to understand the cultural context within which they emanate from or will be used within so we then have to understand you know are there any props we can use so what are these symbolic props that might be meaningful or valuable to people is there a narrative behind that which we will draw from the communities or the users or whatever that we're going to work with? So, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> how long do you want me to go on about that? Because <laughs> you, you could, you, you'd have to stop me because um, the, the, it's such a, a rich palette of, of, of material here. So, uh, yes, I'm going to stop you because <laughs> uh, there's so much to unpack there. And I think uh, what could be um, interesting before we dive deeper is, uh, would it be interesting to briefly touch upon the differences between rituals, routines, habits? Because when you say rituals have meaning and you give the example of the handshake, I can imagine somebody listening right now would say, how is that? How is that a ritual? That's just uh, like a task, or maybe a habit, or so. Could you briefly touch upon that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, um, I think 
this is something very intentional about rituals and i think handshakes are intentional and I, and i think that if you if i mean i think a lot of people experience those i mean in those cultures where people do shake hands i think what a lot of people experience when covid came you were no longer allowed to shake hands and the the void that that creates of not having that form of communication that's a, that's performative um becomes really very difficult and i think sometimes when you remove a ritual that's when you really notice it's either a habit or a ritual um and one of the an example i've sometimes used is that routines can sometimes feel ritualized but i think when the real difference happens is when you add something that has absolutely no particular value that has some deep performative meaning for yourself so an example that i use is people there are routines of leaving your house sometimes so you may make sure you've got your keys and then you turn on your you know um uh, burglar alarm and then you leave the house if you create the addition of say three taps uh which is a kind of makes a, a kind of closure on your departure and maybe for you it symbolizes that you'll have a better day if you make your three taps then that's the adding of some kind of performative symbolic act that sort of really demonstrate something internal to to be able to sort of cope with the day routines and rituals are quite close habits and rituals are quite close but it's the i think it's the additional of some kind of intentional meaning um that really matters but uh, again these these there's some kind of theoretical fine lines here between what goffman might see as a ritual and what say van gennett might see as a ritual but uh, i don't know if that answers your question um, i think but so it is it is kind of it is woolly I can I can appreciate is that it's kind of some overlapping parts, but it's this kind of intentionality that's really important. The intentionality and mm. like the expressing inner meaning. I don't yes. know if you used yes. that that word. It and is. you mm. already touched upon this, but uh, that's going to be like with all things service related, super contextual and super personal. Like what has meaning for me might not have meaning for you, and might mm. be a routine for you, mm. and might be. I, I might experience it as a as a ritual, correct? Mm. Yeah, I mean totally. But I don't think we ever exist in in um, vacuums. So we do we do exist. So so some things, yes, absolutely, they're just personally meaning for me, and we do create our own little rituals uh, throughout the day. However, there's there's some quite interesting sort of theoretical view on that 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 actually even when we do some rituals on our own, they're often connected to larger cultural and ritual structures um so if we look at rook's work from 1985 he talks about how the coming of age rituals in the in america for 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 young women young girls um a lot of the rituals that they enact they enact on their own at home so they're often sort of grooming rituals that they do however unbeknown to the subject as probably is the case for you and I, Mark, is that we we are actually enacting certain aspects of ritual and meaning that are actually connected to larger uh, larger meaning of society. And that's that's the difficulty to avoid, <laughs> if we want to avoid it. I mean, I think some of it's valuable um, and interesting, um, but clearly, you know, a Christmas ritual is going to be different for families, but this still connects to a larger accepted um, grouping of meaning you might say and even if you reject that meaning it still exists so you're you're taking a stand against something uh, that's definitely there <laughs> now um i'm i'm curious if we could look into rituals in the context of services because my limited uh, understanding of rituals and vocabulary is i'm thinking of of uh quite uh experience driven events um like, like you said may maybe your marriage or christmas dinner um those wouldn't be events w that i would describe maybe as services so uh i don't know services feel maybe more transactional to me or uh so i, I i'm i'm curious like uh could you give some examples maybe of how rituals augment improve services i think that what got me sort of interested in this subject i mean i started looking at rituals back in the 90s with when i did a master's in product design at st martin's and so i got really interested in this idea of how do we create rituals around products how do you how we use them 
and whether they increase the experience, improve the experience. And we, I mean, people have designed rituals around products for, for, for years. I mean, just the way we design, the, the way we open a cigar, it creates anticipation and experience. And um, a wonderful chap at Imperial uh, College called Weston Baxter, who's uh, an associate professor there, he's been doing, you know, experimenting around food. So, you know, if you, if you design a little ritual around the consumption of food, so just something as banal as clapping your hands, they showed that the test groups who tried this, one without a ritual, one with ritual, had thought the chocolate tastes better. So if we just take on that sort of micro ritual level, there's obviously potential here to improve rich, uh, service experiences through smaller ritual interactions. And uh, and um, so, uh, for example, I was working with um, a telecom company, and so we have new technology that comes in, which is you know tapping to pay with your telephone. It's, it's, it creates new a sort of a new space for rethinking how do we work through these almost like rituals of, of paying at dinner so you know you're out with friends oh no i'll pay no you pay so which is kind of a a, a ritualized performance uh, if you if you uh, follow goffman's view of these ritualized performances between us so it's like how do we design a ritual of this new technology tapping to pay with the phone that creates a better experience for everyone um and and heightens this experience so we can take just that as a simple a simple view however i think so there's one thing about designing rituals themselves and and finding the right points in a service to to use them so entering a, a restaurant or being welcomed at a restaurant or um, I don't know, uh, you know entering into a hospital what's it like you know the reception can we do some ritualized things to make this this easier or using then ritual as an, an entire structure for the redesign of a whole experience. So um, I was working with the, the Norwegian Football Association, with professional football, with the, the, the national team. So it's like, well, okay, you think maybe football is pretty ritualized already, but we do know with national football, it's more difficult to engage people because they're not as close to it as say a local club. And it's, well, how do we lift the experience of going to the stadium and bring back more meaning so that people actually want to go to the stadium instead of staying at home and watching it on TV? So then it's like then using ritual structures of separation, transition, liminal, and reincorporation to design a very new kind of customer journey. So you've still got before and you've still got after, but then you've got the, the main part of the service experience with phases that creates a sort of intentional emotional outcome uh, through the whole game. And then you're designing these sort of service encounters. I call them meaningful service encounters where we can try and perform out some of the meaning that can happen in the service. So this is in a hedonic service. And I can see that that might not seem relatable to say hospitals or, or for banking and those kind of things. Um, so, so just to recap, you, I think it's the identifying potential moments of transition where you could add something meaningful or alleviate anxiety or using the whole sort of ritual structure to create um, entire experiences with high points, you know, because there's a kind of a, an emotional and experiential high point in the middle of, of um, in the middle of a, a ritual experience. So what I'm trying to work with now is to say, well, what, what does this mean? Um, in, in medicine. So I'm working with uh, a doctor at Stanford at the moment to say, well, you know, we, we're seeing this enormous amount of burnout and stress for doctors. So how could we design a sort of chains of rituals or, or transitional points in these very stressful shifts just to kind of work with self-care at those moments? So here again, it's like, can we find these emotional airlocks that people can sort of you know, decompress a little bit before moving to the next task. And rituals um, can help do that. So yeah, I think I think there's I think there's potential for rituals as the small micro interactions. I think there's the potential of ritual frameworks to create dramaturgy for a, a larger service experience. I think it's relevant for users, uh, but I also think it's relevant for staff and people working within um, you know, stressful or, or, or difficult services. I'm 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 fascinated um, uh, by what you just said, and I'm thinking of uh, sometimes it's easier to think about um, what's what do we miss if our services aren't um, infused with rituals or aren't designed with a ritual perspective? Like, what 
tapping, paying the bill, tapping the phone. Like, how would you, what do you use when you look at that kind of sort of moment or service? What's missing from your perspective there? What's the opportunity there? Well, I think, I mean, I think just, I, think, I mean, this, this is, um, again, I, I think my answers are too long. Sorry, Mark. But um, I think we have some social norms. Um, and I think we, we, I think, say like, I think the example is the handshake. When we take the handshake away during COVID, we struggle a little bit. It feels weird for quite a long time. I think, say, like, we, we have digital meetings. And, I, and if you remember the start of COVID, that was dreadful. We had none of these transitional rituals to find a really good way to come into a digital meeting. So it would all stand about. And we don't know how to take the word of a room. We, there's no fruit on the table. There's none of that sort of those, though, or biscuit or refreshments. It's kind of this really awkward, weird, interactional digital space. But as human beings, we're not just that. We, we are cultural beings um, we're social beings and we're we're used to those kind of performative interactions so things like paying it becomes a, a form of ritualized behavior um where you know these things are said oh no i'll take this no you know and they and Kaufman would point to those those kind of terms and those interactions as a form of ritual because you're sort of performing out that thing of sort of these socially acceptable things. No, I'll pay. No, I'll take this or whatever it might be. And then if you remove some of those existing um, performative aspects and you're bringing something new into it, how do I integrate that into my sort of uh, normal repertoire of, of micro rituals? I think the other question then is a broader one. And I think this is about what should services be like okay and i think there is there is a, a there is some tradition in 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 service design which is interactional and it draws from service marketing and service management and from interaction design and i see a lot of uh, service design and brilliant as it is it's a, it's very much about quality and efficiency how do we make things easier to use how do we make things faster all those kind of things but not everything in life needs to be faster <laughs> and maybe there's some things that could actually be better uh, and more experience rich. So one of the areas that we're investigating at the Oslo School of Architecture and Design is this, you know, this idea of highly experiential services. So this is referenced back to Zomadink and, and back in the back about 10, 15 years, start talking about experience centricity. Simon Clapp were they obviously a big voice in this area. And it's to say, well, how do we raise the craft work around the experience? It's like if you can imagine there's a crafting of an experience in, in a service. And so how do we create these experiential rich uh, experiences? And so I think ritual is one of those things that lifts that, creates that. So if you look at a um, a retail outlet like Airsop, I don't know if you know Airsop at all. It's, um, it's, a, it's a soap and you know, grooming shop. They always have a beautifully designed interiors. It's beautifully crafted. They always have a sink in the room that you can wash your hands and try the products, the, the way that the staff work, all that stuff. It's beautifully crafted as an experience, you know what I mean? And, um, and I think that um, there is great potential to not just think about quality and efficiency all the time. And this, I also think is really important within um, public services as well. So, I, th I think one of the areas that I'd love to spend more time investigating, but I don't, is this idea of serviceization. So how do we how do we turn products into services and get people to consume services instead of products? And we see got car manufacturers now, say like Volvo with Volvo Care, where they're trying to get people to um, uh, subscribe to their cars rather than actually buying one. And they've tried to create a kind of experience around it with a personal valet who helps you with Volvo. And it's, it looks more like a quality hotel experience rather than a car experience. Now, the reason why I'm talking about this is that I think if we want to get people to move from products to services to hopefully reduce our carbon footprint, we have to make those services better than the products. We need to have to make those services better than the product. So I, I believe in a, an idea that maybe we could actually reduce our sort of carbon imprint by creating these services that are just so amazing, um, experience rich uh, services um, that people will drop products because they're actually better. Um, and so I think there's a, a, I think there is a need for revolutions in efficiency, which uh, San Giorgio and Moroni talk about. I think those are really important. We do need 
um, revolutions in, in efficiency. But I do also think we need revolutions in experience to encourage people to choose services over products. And this is one aspect. So rituals are experience rich. They heighten your experience. They can create really positive and heightened feelings. So why not be using them? Another very long answer. I'm sorry, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I, I like these answers because there is so much to unpack. Um, and uh, excuse me for just uh, taking a snippet out of your answer and uh, uh, pulling that thread. When I'm listening to your story, I, I, I'm hearing different things like uh, it's, it's, rituals can be a way to increase value perception. They can be, uh, like you say, just a way to create better services. What I'm also hearing, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, again, the example of the handshake and when that goes missing, um, rituals are a way to make things easier and more comfortable. Like uh, without the handshake, you said things become awkward online. And I can imagine the same goes. And again, I'm picking, I'm just picking out some of your examples, but paying the bill can become awkward. And if you have a ritual that feels that that fits within the culture, the social norms, um, you could say that it makes the service efficient, but it's not the word that we're uh, using there, it makes it more comfortable, easy, um, familiar. That's the thing, at least one of the things that I'm getting out of your examples. Does that make sense? Yeah, and then it's absolutely correct. So, and, and I think this is maybe one of the difficulties of talking about rituals is that um, the more I've dug into this, and that's probably why my PhD took 10 years because I couldn't help myself. I'd read one thing and then I want to read the next thing, want to read the next one. And it would have been just so much easier if I just said, what? would the theories of Goffman or what would the theories of Van Gennep mean for services? But instead, just open this huge can of worms, which just became too extensive. But there's so many theories about ritual and all of them are really interesting and relevant. So there's one thing about, you know, just ritual as a way to alleviate anxiety. It's just one area that's interesting. So these small performative acts that allow us to know how to do things and make a transition from one phase to the next phase. And whether that phase is leaving the restaurant, getting to know someone or getting married. They're just these kind of social performances that allow us to get from one place to the next place. But if you look at, say, Durkheim's work, and this was really my starting point, because I think I was what fascinated me 11 years ago is how euphoric people got just buying Apple Macs. You know, so people will be getting these extraordinary heightened, effervescent experiences. Um buying Macintoshes, which is kind of crazy. I can't imagine somebody buying a Hewlett Packard and getting <laughs> quite as uh, amazed. But so, so and, and there's a lot written about that in uh, consumer culture theory. So Russell Belt back in the 80s starts writing about almost these sacred experiences that people are having around their products. And so what was interesting for me is like, well, if this is obviously delivering enormous value for people, they're really enjoying these products because of the a, a form of ritualization, sacralization. What could that mean for services? You know, could it encourage people to use services of a product? It opened all this sort of area. So, so there is this other part of ritual, which is we haven't really touched on enough because I've been talking about this idea that it just alleviates anxiety, which it doesn't. It's not just that. Um, if you look at Durkheim's view of ritual, what's happened is what's called collective effervescence. So there's this idea there's a collective heightened experience that comes out of ritual interactions in groups of people. Um, now, that could be sinister, but I also think that it's also very positive. So going to a concert, going to a football match, these are heightened, wonderful experiences where people have a shared focus and it kind of just uh, disrupts some of our views of service design, which is the idea, oh, we, we need to design for individuals. It's about this, uh, you know, if you look at uh, service dominant logic, this is idea is, is that it's an internalized phenomenological value is understood by something that's happening in our heads. But we do see phenomena where people have these collective experiences, um, intersubjective experiences, where people are able to sort of feed off each other and have really good experiences. So we see some service and literature. It's about, well, you know, how do we manage other people in the store so that the individual can have a great experience? Well, why don't we design for users or maybe what do we, can we design experiences that are for participants rather than users? I don't like the term user. It always seems like you 
kind of bake someone down to their interaction with a service. You use this, so you, that's all you are. But actually, we're, we're rich humans. Um, so, so how do we create these experiences where maybe we design for collective experiences instead of thinking always about individual experiences, which again, maybe could lift ex services to be more attractive than owning an individual product. We could actually have these collective experiences that are really high and really wonderful, uh, designed very for specific groups of people um, that delivers meaning and, and creates really fantastic service experiences. So, so there's different aspects of ritual, um, which of course a 45 minute podcast isn't going to cover, but I think we can see these as there's and and that's why they're so important to us eh, through 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 our sort of human development is to have these micro exchanges that deal with anxiety or or maybe in fact in the coming of age is that ritual is about anxiety. But then through the rituals we can create these heightened and, and extraordinary experiences for people too. These heightened experiences, uh, you gave two examples of the concert and the football match. I can imagine like, again, a marriage or going to church or something like that. There are mm. so similar experiences. Um, have you seen uh, examples where these heightened experiences are brought more into, I don't know, our day-to-day -day services? Well, or, is mean, it, or is that really tricky? I mean, that that's that's yet to be designed for and uh, but i do think we <laughs> one of the things we've talked about with my colleagues at the Oslo school of architecture and design is this idea of these um extraordinary ordinary experiences so how do we maybe create these like small little service interactions that make us go oh that was that was brilliant that was a really nice thing so they're not out of this world i mean not i don't think you could maintain a service experience that's that's like a marriage uh, experience and being the groom or the bride or, or, or vice versa. So I don't think you could create that. You don't want to create that. You don't want to go to the laundrette to, to clean some clothes and be going, you know, it just wouldn't be sustainable. So I think, I think, but I think there are, so I think this is kind of like, you might say that, that if you had a, if you had um, a, a, a volume switch <laughs> on it. So maybe there's, there's some, there's some light little rituals that you want to add occasionally through different aspects of a service, you know, you know, onboarding or arriving or something like that, or when you're leaving, or those kind of smaller things that just allow you to to have these simple interactions. But maybe there is call for these, you know, um, greater experiences uh, or heightened experiences. And and this, which is a great segue to talk maybe about, I think, say for. I think often we think about services as both these interactions, uh, so or a touch point. So, for example, with an insurance company, you may have a whole of life relationship to the insurance company, and usually, you know, all you're getting really is a letter occasionally to tell you that your premium, your, your you know, it's going to cost you more each year, or this is the situation we think. But it's such a long term relationship, and and most of the relationships I've had over thirty years there will be some form of ritualized interaction at some point. Uh, one's the, you know, the mean, the meaningful experience, you know, relationships we've had. Now, you might argue, and this is fair enough, and I'm just using this as an example off the top of my head, that maybe we don't need a meaningful uh, relationship to our insurance company, but there, there surely is some potential to raise the experience or I'll give a better experience. If after 10 years, I get a, a letter that just said, thanks for being a customer 10 years and, we're having this thing that we'd like you to come to. I don't. Know. But the point I'm making is, is that I think there we don't also have to think about every service experience has to be heightened, but we can also use time, maybe a calendrical one or one over a longer period of time, to add more uh, meaningful experiences along the way, especially if we have a longer a longer relationship with a service. Yeah, two things that uh, came to mind when you were sharing this example, um, and uh, I'll share them both, and then it's up to you which, which avenue you explore. Sure. <laughs> uh, I mean, <clears throat> I, I would be interested if uh, rituals tend to lose their value if they are uh, too frequently repeated, and like, do we lose meaning? Uh, as in, if we would, if somebody would stand and cheer every time we walk into the grocery store, like. Would it still have value after I don't know twenty encounters? So that's one thing that I was curious about. And the other thing is, um, like, what would you say to people who say, "Well, this just sounds like uh, an unnecessary luxury"? Uh, 
I don't need rituals with my insurance company, like you said. Like they just they just need to do a good job. I think to answer the first question, I think yes, uh, but I depends what the ritual is. <laughs> it really depends what the ritual is. I think uh, this is not something I've investigated, so I'm speculating really. Uh, so I think it depends what the ritual is. So uh, a handshake we never really get tired of. It still seems kind of okay, um, and it depends on the context. And I also think. With any of these things, it's also about what feels authentic. So I think if it feels superficial or super superficial, I was going to say, it, it does. It does feel like oh, this person's just doing this for the sheer hell of it. So there has to be something at stake for you and your relationship to the place that you're going. And I think, say for example, the rituals work really nicely at Airsop because I do think a lot of people who use the Airsop uh, cosmetic brand are quite loyal. They have an emotional attachment. I think it kind of can work in 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 the football for the same reasons so i think it's an interesting investigation to look at it's like well, you know how much is too much and do is is it the, about the levels of elaboration around the the ritual or is it the sense of authenticity what you know what's what's the what's that aspect so the your question about the insurance do i need to have a ritualized experience from my insurance company i think this i think it's i don't know I, I would have, again, that would be something to really look into. But I also think because we're, we're having a discussion about rituals and we're unpacking what rituals are, and suddenly we have this, we're starting to understand, oh, gosh, they have they have meaning and they have structure. And, but some people don't even, some, some people don't even recognize at times that they're engaged in a ritual or ritualized activity, even if it has meaning to them, because they don't, they, a lot of people identify ritual, obviously, as something that, happens at church or in, in a or in a synagogue or in a mosque. But um but obviously they're happening all over the place. So so again I think it's it's about do we are we able, fully able to identify things as ritual? Um and I don't know the answer to your question. And I would love to do a study about you know ritualizing aspects of interaction between uh customers and um and the insurance companies but i did we did something with banking and that was also quite interesting to sort of look at potential spaces where customers could come together more and maybe sort of when you move from one credit credit level to the next is there a kind of transition and what's the story behind that what fits with the symbols of those things and and it it it, it did seem to show some value for people but um i i think again it's uh identifying the right context for this so as i going back to what i said before I'm not sure if the laundry is the right place, but uh, I think it's identifying needs that um, either one of this kind of anxiety question uh, and the other one is two, could we just gen genuinely create value for people with heightened experiences? You mentioned something about does it feel authentic and um that's also maybe a thing we should briefly touch upon like uh, what are the ethics around or ethical questions around rituals um, um there, there's always an agenda especially when you're dealing well no matter with who you're dealing with like there's always an agenda with a handshake it might be to get into somebody's favor or well if it's your own agenda then it's re relieving anxiety but um in other like in other cases, I can imagine that uh, no, can there be malice intent with oh. around rituals? And mm. if so, what would that be? Well, I mean, clearly, I mean, clearly, I mean, the ethical questions come up quite a lot, really, and uh, and I think it's because there feels like a degree of hocus pocus in 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 designing rituals, which obviously can create these strong emotional responses. Um, and then there's also the fear of mass suggestion. We're going to work with groups of people and create these experiences. So I think any any design, I think any design that we do is about there's a form of manipulation. I think because we're creating channels for people to have experiences, and we have an idea of the experience that we want them to have, and we're trying to design maybe those different channels, those different touch points to to give somebody an experience. So I think if we, I think the closest I can come to is this is like working sort of looking at the the um, ethical questions around nudging. So, and so nudging, I've been a lot to talk about nudging in service design. How do we sort of affect people's behavior, maybe more positive behavior, those kind of things. And I, and I think that, you know, as long as it doesn't, um, 
disrespect that sort of human autonomy, then then this I don't think it's problematic. I think, and I think if the intention is to give someone a, a great experience, then I think that's you know we are curators of experience anyway, as service designers. I just think when we start talking about rituals, it seems a bit scary because it seems much more manipulative. But I think all designers have a form of manipulation because everything that we put into someone's space is because we have a clear idea that we want them to have an experience of some form or another. So I think it's about being respectful. And I, but I do think one of the things that I, from at least from my approach, is to really deeply try and understand the group of people I'm designing for and the things that matter to them. It's not like, it's not just adding meaning, some, something coming from the side. And this also addresses the question about authenticity. I think it's really important to try and, uh, so, so the big part of the process that I do is, is to go deep into a, a form of sort of um, cultural analysis, to try and understand what matters to people. And I think any of that material that you use from what matters to people, you have to handle very, very carefully because you're now curating uh, experiences for people that's using things that matter to them. But I think designers have often been those kind of cultural intermediaries, cultural interpreters to create uh, objects or, or, or experiences that can connect to people in really meaningful ways. So like anything, it could be abused. I think that's, I think that would be always my message. And I think it's about doing it in a really respectful way for the people who you're designing for. Yeah, uh, it can be abused for sure. And I think if we look into the dark patterns, uh, uh, knowledge that's already around, mm -hmm. that's going to be applicable here. Mm. Uh, another thing I, I want to explore uh, briefly is you mentioned you do a lot of research around what's meaningful to people, right? Mm. Yeah. Are there any uh, sort of subtle differences compared to what service design professionals already do because i can imagine somebody listening to this will say yeah i'm already researching mm. what what people find meaningful like mm. is it, like is your work more specific different are you looking at other aspects Ooh, i mean that's a, that's a good question um I, I don't i wouldn't say we have a monopoly on designing for meaningful experiences i really don't think that and i think i think good designers have always dug into what matters to people um i do sometimes think and i'm going to stick my neck out here there is there's there has because of the way service design has developed and you know as i said you sometimes drawn a lot from interaction design service management service marketing there is there can sometimes be a tendency to look at the functionality how do i make this touch point easier to use in relationship to other touch points how do i how do i create a an easier experience to use things. Now that's a sweeping generalization. So, but I think there is a tendency towards that because of where we come from. Um, and I don't read a lot of of, of, of um, service design um, literature that's about you know, design for meaningful experiences for people. So, so there's not a lot of literature out there which suggests you know that, that at least people aren't writing a lot about it. However, I think a lot of good designers. Uh, going back to where we started, you know, this this idea of a professional designers will always be trying to locate their designs within the culture where they're working and to make sure that it means something, uh, at least just to be usable so we can actually read what we're being presented with. And I'm not talking about read as in text, but read culturally, read what's actually being presented to us. But I don't see the literature out there that says a lot about, you know, how do we design for meaningful service experiences? There's stuff in there from product design and there's stuff in interaction design, but less so in service design. So um, I'm saying um, we don't have a monopoly on it. And I think good service design will always be have that in their mind uh, to be able to create that. You've been exploring this topic for many, many years. You've done a lot of presentations uh, publicly, privately to many corporations. When you share this story, what's like the most common question you get? <laughs> I, I mean, I do. Get, uh, well, gosh, that, that, that's a really good question, Mark. And now I have to think question mark. Here's a question mark. Um, I, I don't know. I, I, a question. Yeah, what questions do I get? Um, 
I usually, I mean, I think most people see that this value, and, I, and it's, it's one of those things where we're here talking, and I can't show you a presentation for those people listening on a podcast, can't show a presentation. And I, it is funny as a designer to be, not be able to create visuals to show people because it makes it so much easier. So I'm describing to you the, you know, football game and, and as a ritual structure. And I'm normally will have behind me a big picture of the customer journey for the ritualized customer journey for the football pitch and I can point at things. So I so I think I think um it's one of those slow burn things. I present this to people and then they have to think a little bit and say, mm. and then Afterwards, it's like, well, you know, how do I find, how can I utilize this and find value? I've had the occasional question about ethics. And, and again, it's one of the things I think is really, really important that we, we discuss. Um, and I say, I'm comfortable with using the approach, but I, I can see that some people might see if it's wrong, used in the wrong way, it could be quite manipulative. So that, that's come up occasionally. But I, I think, um, I, I don't think, I don't know if I have an answer to that, Mark. I'm sorry. I, I, I yeah, it's, but most people probably, most people probably just sat there thinking, this guy's crazy. What, what the hell is he talking about? Let's get out of the room before before he tries to ritualize this. Uh, so uh, let's let's hope this inspired some uh, people who are listening, um, and uh, they would be interested to uh, start going down this rabbit hole. Uh, what would be some uh, good resources to start? Um, yeah, I mean, obviously, this this is will feel like a moment of self promotion, but um, there are a number of people I think have got some really interesting work in this area. Um, my work specifically around service design, so you can find my PhD online, and you can download it from the the Oslo School of Architecture Design's website. It's it's, I don't recommend reading it. It's a nightmare. It's a far, it's too long and it's too complicated. But there is a chapter in Simon Clatworthy's book um, called the uh, uh, oh, what's it called? The Experience Centric Organization. That's the name of the book. And my, I have a chapter in there which I refer to my processes designed for meaningful experiences. Um, there is also a forthcoming book by Holmlead, Clatworthy, and Blomqvist, which is coming out in spring. Uh, which is a book about the, so this is a very exciting book and really needed. It's a book that examines what are the materials of service design. So it's a book full of short chapters about discussing aspects of, of the materials of service. And, and I have a chapter in that, which is a four page, very easy to understand ritual as material for service. Design. So that comes out in the spring. I can also recommend a book by uh, Kurshat Othink, uh, who's um, a friend of mine from Stanford, who works, who has the Ritual Design Lab. He's looking at um, how you design rituals for business and what have you. And then there's also um, Weston Baxter at Imperial College, who has a sort of human behavioral view of, of rituals, which is also very interesting. So that's a long list of people. And I can supply you with people's names yes. and you can post <laughs> we'll those. We'll make sure so. to add all the links yeah. Uh, yeah. to that. So there's like, I think the uh, conclusion here, there's more than enough to explore and read Absolutely. And, and, uh, and digest and yeah. uh, get even more inspired. Um, so we've come a long way in this conversation. Uh, many uh, questions unanswered, but that's great. Uh, if you had to leave somebody with one thing, if they just take away one thing from this entire conversation, what do you hope it is? I think, I think because perhaps not, we're not always aware of these things, but rituals are so important every day uh, from, from the way we greet each other to the way we sort of add meaning to time through the week, through the months, through the years, through our lives. I think if we don't design or be at least conscious of ritual as an important material in service design, then I think uh, our designs are less human centric. So I, I, if you can take anything, I'm not suggesting people should create these huge sort of ritualized experiences, but I just would love for service designers in their practice to think, is this a good, would this be the good point or is this a really positive point for a transition that's positive and would help someone deal with something difficult and whether that's just meeting someone or maybe it's just someone moving into their last home could we can we find those rituals will help people through the day or can we find rituals that just create these lovely little experiences for people so that's what i would hope people would see from this yeah mm -hmm. awesome i uh, i totally see it and i'm totally going to apply it to the services that i'm i'm providing to uh 
uh, to the community. So th thanks for coming on. This was really inspiring. I really enjoyed this episode. I really enjoyed this conversation and I hope we'll be able to continue it in uh, one way or the other. But uh, for now, we'll have to wrap this up. And um, once again, thank you, Ted, for coming cool. on and sharing. Thanks for having me and, and allowing me to wrap it on for, for too long at times, but I really enjoyed it myself. So thanks a lot. Awesome that you're one of the people who made it all the way to the end of this episode. I really hope that you enjoyed it. Make sure to leave a comment down below and share what is your biggest takeaway from this conversation. My name is Mark Fontaine and I want to thank you for tuning in to the Service Design Show. And I really look forward to see you in the next video.